Mr. Flips. 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 This video is going to explore Act 2, Scene 2 of Measure for Measure. Uh, it's quite a long scene, so I have broken it into two videos, uh, just for the sake of YouTube management. Um, but it's quite interesting, uh, this scene. It's interesting thematically because it in explores uh, the ideas of, of um, Christian morality uh, and what's right and what's wrong in the eyes of God. Uh, it's interesting from, well, I guess another theme that's explored is that idea of uh, uh, the rights of the ruler and, and how to sanction or how to enforce law uh, in order to, to manage a, a community. Um, but it's also interesting theatrically in the way that it's set up. So essentially we're dealing with um, first Provost and then Isabella coming to plead with Angelo uh, for Claudius' lives, <coughs> Claudius' life. But um, at the same time, there's people on the sidelines kind of cheering her on. Uh, so initially, uh, obviously, she's brought there by Lucio. Uh, so Lucio does comment initially about her success and how what strategies to take initially allowed to her, but then uh, as a side, just to himself. Uh, and later on, the provost chimes in as well, and he also uh, supports Isabella's efforts. So theatrically, it's interesting the way this would have been staged with Isabella and Angelo having the conversation whilst the provost as well as Lucio are in the, <coughs> um, on the outskirts uh, making comments of their own on the progress of the conversation. Uh, it's obviously also interesting to see Angelo's uh, subconscious and honest opinion when he concludes in the soliloquy on the end where we see the honest Angelo really for the only time in the play where he openly confesses, um, or one of the few times at least, where he openly confesses what he actually feels and that the guilt um, that is plaguing him uh, and his morality. So we start off with, with the provost coming back yet again to see Angela just to assure himself about the death sentence on Claudio, um, which is interesting given that it's only in the previous scene that Angela has asserted this one more time and said, yes, it's going to happen at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. But the provost still comes in, and as soon as uh, Angelo is free to talk to him, he, he asked, are you sure um, that you want me to carry it out? Is it your will that Claudia shall die tomorrow? Uh, and, and Angelo is, is um, quite surprised, I guess, that he is being asked again, uh, because he, he questions, did I not already tell you um, that that is the fact? <coughs> Has that not ordered? Um, but the provost just wants to make sure, I don't want to be too rash, um, because it has happened in the past, that after the execution, that people have repented or changed their minds. And he's hoping, obviously against hope, that uh, Angelo will have changed his mind. But the provost then says, let, let me worry about that. It's not your issue. I'm sticking to my order. Uh, and instead, the provost then changes to ask what to do about the groaning Juliet, because she's very near um, delivering her child. Um, so Angelo is a bit more lenient with Juliet, quite a bit actually. So he says at this point to send her to some fitter place uh, and that with speed. So take her out of the dungeons and on to, to somewhere more suitable for a pregnant woman. Um, then we announce the arrival of Isabella, a Claudius' sister. Um, and the provost announces her as a very virtuous maid and to be shortly of a sisterhood, if not already. So she is about to enter the monastery. Uh, so Angelo then quickly wants to get rid of the idea of um, <coughs> uh, of Juliet, so she can move on to thinking about uh, the conversation with Isabella. So instead he says, so he then follows on with, see, see you the fornicatress, be removed, let have needful but not lavish means. So he's uh, obviously not uh, very flattering in the way he talks about her, but at least he's going to see to her needs, even if they're not going to be extravagant. So Lucio and Isabella enter, uh, and Isabella starts with the greeting, God save your honour, which is quite interesting because this is also how she leaves uh, Angelo at the end of the scene, uh, and he then launch it, launches into the soliloquy where he does question what is his honour and is his, are his actions honourable, uh, is he doing the right thing? So it's quite interesting, kind of in a circular way, the start and the conclusion of their conversation is the same line. 
so at the opening of this conversation, Isabella is kind of showing that you know I'm I'm almost on your side in this matter um, because uh, obviously I'm I'm seeing the Christian morality in, in what you're trying to achieve here. Um, so I am at war twixt will and will not. So it's kind of a of two forces within me. On the one hand, I'm my brother's sister, but on the other hand, I am pledged to the monastery and I need to look after the interest of God. And he can kind of see how there's a, uh, a divide between the two. <clears throat> um, I have a brother who's condemned to die. I do beseech you, let it be his fault and not my brother. So essentially, what, judge his fault, but don't judge my brother. Uh, and um, the provost here, obviously, is... is happy that she's starting to to articulate this idea. But Angela thinks this is a very strange way of of arguing a case. Because how can you condemn the fault and not the actor of it? How can you say it's sinful to fornicate, but you're innocent as a fornicator? Uh, It doesn't quite make sense to him and and I think to anyone. Why every fault condemned ere it be done, right? We can already condemn all these faults. We can say fornication is wrong, uh, other sinful deeds are all wrong, so why would we need to, to try them any further? Mine were the very cipher of a function to find the faults whose fine stands in record and let go by the actor, right? So I can't, I, my job would be finished if I was just to say this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, but whoever does it is not in the wrong. Uh, it would be rather bizarre. <coughs> Um, and Isabella acknowledged, yep, okay, that's that's just, even though the law is severe, I had a brother then. So she sees this as a, a fait accompli, uh, my brother is lost to me. Heaven keep your honour. So again, she comes back to his sense of duty and honour here. And at this point, Isabella is, is prepared to walk away. Um, she's quite uh, ready to, to see that there's nothing else to be done here. But Lucio pulls her aside and says, give not o'er so <clears throat> to him again, and treat him. Kneel down before him, hang upon his gown. You're too cold. If you should need a pin, you could not with more tame a tongue desire it. So really, the way you're actually entreating for your brother's life here, not just asking some random little small favour. You need to really put some heart into it. To him, I say. And Isabella continues, even though it's initially quite a staggering attempt, um, must he needs die. Uh, and Angelo acknowledges, yep, there's no other remedy. Uh, we need to do it in this way. So Isabella continues her rather staggering attempt uh, and says, well, you could change your mind if you wanted to, couldn't you? And uh, Angelo essentially says, nope, he sentenced, tis too late. Uh, and Lucy again saying to Isabella, you're too cold, you need to be more passionate about your suit. Uh, and so she does... Um, increase the emotional intensity in this next speech. And she starts by acknowledging that it never, or rather a test, that it can never be too late. Too late? Why? No. I that do speak a word may call it back again. So if I say something, I can always take it back. Well, believe this. Uh, and then she starts going uh, off to create um, traditional symbols of grace uh, and reverence, things that people are respected for having. Right? Not the king's crown, nor the de- deputed sword, the marshal's trunken, truncheon, uh, nor the judge's robe. Become them with one half, so good a grace as mercy does. So all these symbols mean less than true mercy would. So if you're merciful, that has a lot more um, value in, in the way that people perceive you. <clears throat> uh, and, and Shakespeare really puts stress on that, that last line by using diameter as opposed to iambic pentameter, up here, so just um, two iams to really stress the importance of mercy. If he had been as you and you as he, you would have slipped like him, but he, like you, would not have been so stern. So if we're reversing the roles, um, Claudia would have let you go even if you had slipped up the same way that he did. So here we kind of echo the speech that Aeschylus uh, delivered um, in the previous scene, where he said a similar similar thing to, to Angelo in terms of um, you know, put yourself in his shoes. Have you also not sinned at some point? And we'll come back to this again later in this scene. Isabella then flatters him in a sense, uh, saying that he has great potency and she wishes she had him because if, if you were Isabel, then it shouldn't be this way. And Lucio acknowledges that this 
is a good spot to touch him. I touch him, there's the vein. That's a good place to... But Angelo is, is still resolved. Your brother is forfeit to the law and you but waste your words. So there's no point trying to persuade me. But Isabella tries um, yet another angle and one that really applies to Angelo, obviously. Why, all the souls that were, were forfeited once. And he that might the vantage best have took found out the remedy. How would you be if he, which is the top of judgment, should but judge you as you are? So if Jesus, who is the top of judgment, was to judge you the way you are, just say, this is the law, you didn't follow the law, therefore you die. Oh, think on that, and mercy then will breathe within your lips like man new made. So again, we're using um, a diameter here <clears throat> to show, just to put a bit of emphasis on those last two words of that line. <coughs> but really, you know, essentially appealing to Angelo, saying, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the way that you should lead your life. But Angela persists, and he tries to distance himself from this, saying, it is the law, not I, condemn your brother. So he's trying to not be personally responsible for the action of killing Claudius. Uh, were he my kinsman, brother, or my son, it would be thus with him. He must die tomorrow. And this is news to Isabella. She didn't know before. Uh, and we see that in the exclamations and the, the motive surprise that she shows in the short phrases in the next um, speech. Tomorrow? Oh, that's sudden. Spare him, spare him. Right, A lot of emotion there to show that honest surprise. And then she tries to appeal to, to his sense of this is the way that we should be doing things. He's not prepared for death. Even for our kitchens, we kill the fowl of season uh, and prepare it properly and then we serve it up to whoever's going to eat it. Now you, you're taking a, a dish that's not in season, i.e. Claudia, who's not ready for this, uh, and you're not going to let him prepare properly for his death by doing all his, uh, his the proper rites, and thereby you're serving up a dish to God that you wouldn't serve up to your, your friends or your servants even. Um, so she, again, trying to get at him uh, in terms of his um, religion. And Lucy is saying, yep, that's well said, now you're touching him where he's really vulnerable. <clears throat> 